I, I, I took it hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> so I want you to, you know, uh, since we're in entrepreneurship, let's see if you folks know one of the basic expressions in business and in entrepreneurship. Does anybody know what that expression, caveat emptor, means? It is fun. You got it, Mr. Little, little Poplar. It means buyer beware. And it's, it's a disclaimer. Many businesses will have a disclaimer. Uh, I happen to be reading in the hotel room, if there's a fire, don't take anything with you, run out of the room and bring your key. And right next to it is a phrase, it is a legal uh, conditions, we are responsible for nothing that's lost in the fire. That's a disclaimer. So we got to watch the legalese language here, but that's a legal expression. Buyer beware. So I want you. I'm not for sale. <laughs> <laughs> but I want you to beware. Who knows what could happen? Uh, you know, you could be you could be sucked in like I was. You were naked at the hotel or the Democrats, huh? Now folks, all last week we were very intensive. Really, we morphed into a creative writing workshop with the members of uh, Change It Up. And they they were never told who would come to talk with them. They were never told the name of the author. <coughs> They were never told the name of the book, and here's the book, The Trees Are Still Bending South. And they were never told the title of the poems. What I did instead, uh, Ms. Prue Turner, is I would take a piece of writing, and I took it from beginning, middle, and end, and I would cut it out, I would photocopy it with Ms. Cryer, and then I would cut it out, and then they would be handed this. They would be handed one of the poems. There is no page, no title, no name of author. There is nothing. The words had to stand or fall on their own merit. And then, like new kids on the block, we went step by step through your poetry. And I'll give you an example. We'll start out, and for the first time ever, they're going to hear the poems read out loud by the poet. So, um, maybe we can begin with... Um, let's see. And did you have your own copy with you? Okay. So you don't mind reading from this one? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So, if you would read in a strong, projected voice this poem, of which they don't even know the title. Oh, oh la la. Markers. I'm going to be careful because I've got a lot of markers. See if you remember it, folks, as she reads it out loud. Before I read it out loud, I just want to um, thank all of you for, for being here and for inviting me and for doing the work.
that's how I grew up with an Irish dad. songs rewriting the sky is morning red pours out to the throat and water rose. Their lines unwinding. For each person's life is as sacred as a woman who sits at the foot of a tree, peering down through that sky. Childhood longings, broad strokes of Red, painted onto black scratches, real world of color and light. Whole melodies pushed under the bed, leaving there the wind blowing, calling, calling out a story of what it is to be born between the girls, a tree inside the universe, whose sky holds its blues. Down my bed, bed. Looking down through the plain window, I hear the keys on the piano, fingering those tips of the ears of air. Then small scribbles of snow, the sun's reflection, like a syllabic language fleeting in the ground, defying the blue lines imposed on the ground. Where the wind and the ice sends messages skyward. More water, more ice. Words refracted for the birds to read, to the star people. And in the spring light, the snow around the trees accentuates their greens and cold and autumn. And as the plain descends, I know us may tea. Always like to live by the water. In my bones, I know why. Not just for transportation, but for Do you folks remember that one? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Ms. Prudjorn, when I said it's like new kids on the block, step by step, they received your poem uh, on, on that paper with no reference whatsoever. I asked them, would you please read it? once, straight through, and write one word about it. Okay, so they did that. And they were all, all there at their computers. I said, now would you please read it a second time, straight through, and write a, a, a sentence about it. And a sentence is just a verb and a noun. Anything else is up to them. Subsequently, I asked them, would you please read it a third time, straight through and write a paragraph about that piece of writing. I mean, incidentally, I never called it a poem. I always referred to it as a piece of writing so that they would interpret it however they wanted. Um, and would you please write a paragraph? The paragraph is two sentences or more. Then I asked them, would you please read it a fourth time straight through and in a stream of consciousness vein, write everything that goes through your mind about the, uh, that piece of writing. Now, in actual fact, this was the last piece of writing they received. We had been doing this all week, so I figured, well, now's the time for them to try and make a mental picture of who's writing this. And, of course, James Joyce wrote a, a very, a very well-known book. James Joyce, one of the, the great novelists of the 20th century, called Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. So I asked them, would you please 
write a portrait of the artist. How do you see the person who's writing uh, this? And I, I said, whoever wrote this. I didn't even say it was masculine, feminine, one or more people, just whoever wrote this. And I figured, you know what? Poets, uh, poets are about creativity, and that's really what the focus of our week together. It was creativity as an operative principle for entrepreneurship, for business. Uh, because that's what makes business happen. Um, and I invited them to make up their own words and to give their own definition of that word. So with your permission, theirs, I'd like to share with you how the members of Change It Up engaged you without ever meeting you, but through your words. So here we go. <laughs> what did you say, Mr. Brown? It's a free word for uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> and in Rajit, feel free to move up for the sound, uh, whatever it will help. Well, here's here's one of the members of Change It Up. Now, incidentally, um, I, I'm, I'm very jealous of their names. May I introduce you to Ms. Rattlesnake? And Mr. Yellowbird? Ms. Northwest? I mean, and, and Ms. Saddleback? And so I, and Mr. Little Poplar, and I said, what am I doing with such a dull name like Cornette? Well, you could change it to Cornette. <laughs> <laughs> so since it was a matter of getting our bearings, and there was somebody in the seminar named Ms. Northwest, I said, would you please call me from now on South by Southwest? <laughs> and I invited the members of the seminar, as I've just told you. Well, here's... Well, one of the people, and I'm going to give you a sense because you're a craftsperson of words. You're um, a wordsmith. Well, here's one of the words that a seminar member made up after reading your poem. I can all write it for me. Because business is about coming up with your own ideas. So they invented, their word invention was to morning, and this means tomorrow in the morning. Because we want to encourage them in their businesses, in their entrepreneurship, to think new thoughts, to come up with new ideas and new ways of expressing them, of getting them across. And that's why I felt it was important to invite you, because that's really your specialty, your expertise, how to express oneself how to get the ideas across, and how to have an impact. Well, here's a, another member of, um, of Change It Up on the same poem. And here they wrote in a stream of consciousness, in, in dialogue with you, not having yet met you. This piece is saying to me that the writer is coming home after a long while. How he dreams of laughing and the innocence of childhood. The time in his life that has long since gone. I too am brought to my own childhood and how when we moved away from grandmother I couldn't wait to see her. I couldn't wait to play in the bushes with my uncles. We were all innocent and free. Everything seemed to shine each morning. Watching my kokum cooking up a storm for the two of us, and then secretly telling me to get ready so we could go to town. Good times, just her and I. I was her baby, and I miss her. She was the one I ran to, to tell everything, everything good that happened in my life. She was the one I needed to tell. I no longer have anyone to share the pride in my children and grandchildren. 
no one to tell how happy, sad, or confused I am. She was the only one that truly loved me. And I long to be just like her. I learned everything I know from her. She was my greatest mentor. And I hope one day that one of my grandchildren feels like that about me. For the greatest thing on earth that I can become is to be just as wonderful as my Coco. I love you, Coco. This is where my thoughts are right now. Whether it makes sense or not, my Coco is home to me. So we invite you to riff on that, Ms. Pooh Turner. <laughs> we'll open it up. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm an Unless they identify themselves, it's anonymous. It's up to them to say who wrote it. Mm -hmm. They're right there it, in front of you. It just, it just really demonstrates the power of writing. You know, um, to be able to feel all those feelings from somebody else's words. Like when I was listening to that, I felt so much. And um, how that person was reading what I wrote and then went into her or his own world. And then when I'm listening to their words, I'm going into my own And it just kind of demonstrates the power of writing, the power of story, the power of words to, um, you know how they tell us that words are sacred? And it really um, comes home about just emotionally, because it's almost like that emotions are um, where everything eventually ends up, is in emotion. Mm -hmm. Everything comes out from emotion and goes into emotion. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That was <laughs> Maybe we almost cry listening to it. Yeah. <coughs> <laughs> well, the first lesson in this is never underestimate your potential, folks. You know, you have an award-winning writer here who has just said, whoa. Or as the trickster told me, the name of Hobima, I didn't know the origins of that word, Hobima. <laughs> and I learned that this was because somebody came into this territory and their horse was running away and their horse's name was Bima and they had to tell him, Oh, Bima! <laughs> <laughs> this is how I get sucked in. <laughs> and, you know, just, just listening now to this dialogue, 
between what you've written and what one of the seminar members wrote. You know, in the Bible, and I'm a religious studies scholar, the Psalms are actually songs. And then later they were put into writing and became poems. And there's one of the Psalms that says, Deep calls unto deep at the sound of thy waters. And really what's just happened is deep has called unto deep. It's a communion of souls from the depths of their soul. Well, here's another seminar member. It's the same piece of writing. And we sort of, what we experiment is how we can all read from the same page and every one of us interpret it differently. And that's where the ideas and the riches and the wealth come from. Is from those, rather than seeing, oh, what's the right interpretation of your poem? Well, my interpretation <coughs> brings something totally new to it. And to work with my ideas, my perspective, and my words, I'm bringing something new to the table, which is a, a first principle of business and entrepreneurship. Well, here's another person who invented their own word. I think we're going to have to turn the page. Because I've asked them to be creative, to invent their own words. And well, where did that black pen go? Oh, thanks very much. They invert, in, invented this word. Hacks. Now, we have it on the best authority that hacks means let it go. Just relax. <laughs> and here, now they have no idea who's written these words. I asked them to do a portrait of the artist. Well, here's their portrait. This person is gentle and quiet. She listens to what is being said. Her imagination is un limited, waiting to pour into the real world. Why is she waiting? What is holding her back? She wasn't ready before now. She sure is at this moment. She works with her hands and is a visual person. Her mother is like her opposite. Her mother is loud and cheerful. <clears throat> Opposites attract. Her father is similar, quiet and gentle. She grew up in a family of six kids, she being number five, so she was pampered. Her parents did everything for her. It wasn't helpful for her to go into the world on her own. She had to deal with what life has thrown at her. Now she has three kids and now has to teach them what she has learned. So you, what do you think of that? I wish I had that life. Well, I don't know. Okay, I'm from a family that has seven kids and I'm number two, three. Five girls, two boys. Um, my dad was extremely violent. And um, so was my mom. And I actually experienced a lot of really, really... Uh, I was tortured by the Canadian government from the age of two to 11. Um, and I think that when I was a kid, I knew this old lady, and she once said to me, she says, I guess she must have kind of known what was happening, and she said to me, you know, when children are asked to sacrifice so much, we um, reward it And uh, now in my life, I really <coughs> think that, that it's true. And I think there's a reason why some of us come on this earth I don't 
I don't know the reason, but I know there's a reason. I never started writing or publishing or writing until I was 40. Wow, that's amazing. Because it's a tough, you, you, all of us have got tough rows to hope. Trying to break into the writing business, I'm telling you, I deal with a lot of them. It ain't easy. <coughs> so this is quite remarkable to break into the business at that age. I didn't mean to. But um, I, uh, I, was, I went to, to school, like back to school as an adult, and uh, in my early 30s. I've heard of her name, but I don't know. And I have to say that when my daughter was little, she called her a Reef Avenger. Because she didn't like kids. And, um, but I had her as a teacher in my first English class. And she, uh, either in second or third class, she made us write an essay. And have you ever seen those booklets that you have to write, write in for school? That's all they give you. You sit there and you just have this booklet on your desk. You gotta write in it, and then they take it, turn it in. So we had to write an essay. And um, the lady was, it was a huge class. And she comes back in the class, I don't know, maybe a week or two later. And she has this big pile, because there was like 75 students in there. Big pile of paper, and she slams it on her desk, and she goes, y'all bunch of idiots. She looks around the room like that, and she goes, I don't know how you made it through the house. So, and I'm thinking, mm, I'm paying for this. <laughs> so um, she, um, she said, only two people passed in the whole class. And I get my thing back, and it's got a little recipe card in it with big red writing, and it says, this is no essay, but you sure as hell can write. So that's what I was saying. <laughs> and, um, and I thought, well, gee, I never thought anyone would ever say anything like that. To me. But I never really thought about it because it was hard for me to accept compliments. And um, plus, I didn't know who she was. I had this, I have this idea. I have some other learning disability. So it never occurred to me in my life. I had spell. It never occurred to me in my life. Thank you. 
Yeah, I'm not going to read what I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> 